in the least understood places. Narrated by Richard Thomas, the series features personal commentaries. And after all of her children went to bed at night, she would stay up and polish those floors and polish that woodwork while she waited for my dad to come home from work. Readings from letters and diaries and haunting images. A dramatic account of passion, courage, injustice unfolds through the words of remarkable people, including Logan, an eloquent Indian leader in cold blood and unprovoked men murdered all the relations of logan frontier commander george washington thomas j jackson known as stonewall writer rebecca harding masses of men with dull faces bent to the ground vileness for soul and body the legendary john henry Judas Devil Ants Hatfield, labor leader Mother Jones, and President Jim F. Kennedy. Tonight, the story of West Virginia. Major funding for this program was provided by the State of West Virginia, the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Cutworthington Benedum Foundation, the Clay Foundation, Salem Techio University, the West Virginia Humanities Council, and with the major corporate support of Bank One. Before I grew up and went out into the world, we were all at home there, in our faded cottage in the meadow. All of us, safe and warm. Then I knew just the earth itself, the quiet measure of seasons, the primal certainty of spring. Then we were all there together. The years not yet come on us. These years of war and money and torrents of blood. Louise McNeil. History of West Virginia is a history of conflict, a history of struggle, but it's also a history of people hanging together, of people struggling, of people surviving, of people knowing who they are, and of people learning how to come together to, to increasingly address their problems. And we have a sense of community in West Virginia that many other parts of the country wish they had. It is a place few Americans know and fewer still understand. A place of terrible beauty that many think of as strange and peculiar. Yet its story is distinctly American. It is the story of a frontier where native people fought a tide of white settlers until fighting became impossible. And where America's first great military commander nearly resigned in despair after a string of defeats.
It is the story of a bitter civil war that pitted neighbor against neighbor in guerrilla warfare. While a deeply religious country boy ravaged his native land with ruthless passion. And a struggle for union led to one state being torn in half. It is the story of an explosion of industry that drew workers from around the world to the mountains of Appalachia. Where three young brothers were executed at dusk along a river bank, igniting America's most famous family feud. Where a feisty 80-year-old labor organizer incited coal miners to armed rebellion. And a skinny, jug-eared police chief shot it out with mine guards in a town called Matewan. West Virginia is not your average state. In many ways, West Virginia was a, was a guinea pig for the whole country's experiment in industrialization. And there are plenty of communities around the country, around the developed world now, that are looking up and finding that their main local resources are owned by absentee owners, and they're confronting a situation that West Virginia's confronted for over a century. And it is the story of how an ambitious first lady, shaken by the misery she saw during the Great Depression, created one of America's most controversial social experiments. And a young president focused the nation's attention on a state where the sun does not always shine, he said, but the people do. My grandfather walked over the mountains as an ex-slave and came into West Virginia and established a home. And uh, I have a very firm love and attachment for the state of West Virginia. Uh, I don't believe that my life could be any better anyplace else. And so I intend to try to stay here. I think the mountains burn themselves into the psyche, somehow, or the heart or the soul of people from this place. I first realized it, I think, when I went to study for a semester in England. It's the first time I'd ever been away from West Virginia for more than a week. And at the end of it, I was so homesick. Um, and I could shut my eyes and imagine mountains. And I could almost feel mountains inside of me. It's like this ache. I don't think I've lost that feeling whenever I leave and come back. It's always there. There's a sense that I'm back again. I'm home. On a clear spring night in 1760, a group of Delaware Indians witnessed a vision. On the face of the moon, they saw a horse gallop violently from the east and overpower a horse in the west. The Indians feared the meaning of what they saw. Within their lifetimes, the vision would become reality. For centuries, Shawnees and other native peoples lived along the western banks of the Ohio River. In spring and summer, the Indians stayed in villages, tending plots of corn, beans, and tobacco. 
in fall, they left to hunt for elk and buffalo, returning in late winter. Then the cycle began again. We live upon an island, said a Shawnee. In the water is a great turtle holding up the earth, put there by the great spirit. The area south and eastward of the Ohio River was generally considered by the Indians to be a hunting ground. And it was for the use of all the tribes that surrounded it. The southern tribes would come up from the south to hunt there. And even though many of these tribes were bitter enemies and made incursions against each other and fought vicious war with one another, when they were in this hunting ground, it was a neutral ground. It was where they could commingle, where they could meet, they could talk, uh, and nobody would kill each other. In 1630, the Iroquois Confederacy, a powerful union of Indian tribes, invaded the Ohio Valley. Outnumbered, the Shawnees were forced to flee. Over time, they returned to their traditional homeland and rebuilt their villages. White traders entered Shawnee villages along the Ohio in the 1720s. From the north came the French, from the east the English. The traders wanted furs, fox, mink, and especially beaver for hats popular in Europe. In exchange, they offered goods the Indians had never needed. Brass kettles, broadcloth shirts, guns, and alcohol. When these whiskey traders come, they bring 30 or 40 kegs and put them down before us and make us drink and get all the skins that should go to pay for goods. These wicked whiskey sellers, when they have got the Indians in liquor, make them sell the very clothes from their backs. The Shawnees were soon dependent on European goods. As their need for furs increased, they relied more than ever on their hunting grounds east of the Ohio. In the morning, we set forward early. When we were got up to the top of the mountain and set down very weary, we saw high mountains lying to the north and south as far as we could discern. It was a pleasing, though dreadful sight to see the mountains and hills as if piled one upon another. Robert Fallon. By 1745, 7,000 Virginians had crossed the Blue Ridge Mountains and settled in the Shenandoah and Potomac Valleys. In the fertile bottomlands, Swiss, German, and Scotch-Irish farmers planted corn and fruit trees. On the grassy uplands, they grazed cattle and horses. A British traveler said the settlers have what many princes would give half their dominions for. Health, contentment, and tranquility of mind. Convinced that settlements were essential to controlling land, Virginia promoted western expansion by offering speculators a thousand acres for every family they could place west of the Allegheny Mountains. Andrew Lewis, a young surveyor, mapped 50,000 acres in the Greenbrier Valley for a land company owned by his father and other wealthy Virginia planters. Explorer Christopher Gist claimed 200,000 acres for the Ohio Company, which promised to settle 100 families in the Ohio Valley and build a fort for the protection. Virginia's greatest landowner, Lord Fairfax, hired an ambitious 17-year-old to survey his western lands. After three years, 
George Washington knew Western Virginia as well as anyone and was determined to own some of it himself. In response to British settlements, France sent 200 soldiers accompanied by Iroquois scouts and Jesuit priests to claim the Ohio Valley in 1749. The expedition was led by Celeron de Blainville, a vain officer who referred to Indians as my children. At Shawnee villages along the river, Celeron drove out British traders and left marks of French ownership. I had a leaden plate buried on which was engraved the same possession which I made in the name of the king, of this river and all those which fall into it. I had also attached to a tree the arms of the king, struck on a plate of iron. The Indians were on the watch to discover me. C'est le Ronde de Blainville. After Celeron left, Shawnees dug up all the lead plates they could find, tore down the iron plaques, and trampled them underfoot. The Indian believed that everybody owned the land and nobody owned it. To drive a stake into the earth would be like driving a stake into the breast of their mother. I mean, they considered the earth the mother. When the whites came in and suddenly were building fences, suddenly were claiming lands, cutting down the forest, uh, burning the prairies, destroying, almost always destroying as they came along. This was a concept so far beyond their thinking that it appalled them and they felt it was very, very wrong. An Indian who spoke good English came to me and desired to know where the Indian's land lay. For the French claimed all the land on one side of the River Ohio and the English the other side. My friend, said I, we are all one king's people, and the different color of our skins makes no difference in the king's subjects. Christopher Gist. In the Greenbrier Valley, 50 Virginia families settled, with more on the way. Rival claims to the Ohio Valley ignited in 1753 when 2,000 French troops began erecting forts along the river. Impressed with the show of force and angered by the advancing Virginia settlements, Shawnees cut off trade with the British and joined the French. This colony has always been happy and in firm peace with the Indians till lately. The French have, by threats and promises, seduced some of the Indians from the British interest and with great injustice invaded His Majesty's lands. This is the miserable situation of this colony at present. Robert Dinwiddie. Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie, a former Scottish merchant, sent troops to secure a fort at the forks of the Ohio, the strategic center of the Ohio Valley. One hundred and fifty militiamen were led by Major George Washington and Captain Andrew Lewis. En route, Washington learned that French troops had beat him to the forks and built Fort Duquesne there. But he chose to continue on. Near the Monongahela River, Washington defeated a small French patrol, then built a crude defense. Fort Necessity, in preparation for the main attack he knew would come. On July 3rd, a force of several hundred Indians and French troops assaulted the fort. Greatly outnumbered, 
Washington surrender. The French let Washington go after he promised to stay away from the Ohio for a year. One of Washington's guides, an Iroquois, said later that the French acted like cowards in the engagement and the English like fools. Dinwiddie appealed to Britain for help. London sent General Edward Braddock, a short, arrogant officer who had spent 45 years in the army, yet had seen almost no fighting. Braddock assembled 1,400 British troops and 400 Virginia militiamen, including Lewis and Washington, then marched toward Fort Duquesne. Washington warned of an enemy ambush. Braddock ignored him. Ten miles east of Fort Duquesne, 900 French soldiers and Indian warriors ambushed Braddock's army in a dense forest. Militiamen found cover behind trees. British regulars stood in formation on the narrow road and were cut down from three sides. Our regulars were immediately struck with such a deadly panic that nothing but confusion and disobedience of orders prevailed amongst them. The Virginians behaved like men and died like soldiers. George Washington. Nearly a thousand British troops were killed or wounded. Braddock had four horses shot from under him. As he mounted a fifth, a musket ball pierced his lungs. Carried from the battlefield, Braddock looked up and asked, who could have thought it? Washington ordered a retreat. Along the way, Braddock died. Washington buried him in the middle of the road then marched troops over the grave so Indians wouldn't find it. We have been beaten, said Washington, most shamefully beaten by a handful of men. Braddock's defeat left the Virginia frontier completely exposed to French and Indian attacks. Indian war parties now attacked settlements from the Greenbrier River to the Upper Potomac. Frantic settlers abandoned their farms and fled east. Smoke from burning houses filled the valleys. A militia officer warned that soon there wouldn't be a settler west of the mountains. now commander of the Virginia militia, went to see for himself. In the Potomac Valley, he found the body of a farmer who had been killed by Indians, then partially eaten by wolves. I see their situation, know their danger, and participate in their sufferings without having it in my power to give them further relief. Only uncertain promises. Dispirited, Washington considered resigning his command.
On July 8, 1755, Shawnees attacked a small settlement at Draper's Meadows on the New River. They killed four settlers and took five prisoners, including a pregnant mother, Mary Ingalls, and her two sons. Ingalls gave birth to a baby girl as she was led to a Shawnee village west of the Ohio. There, Ingalls' sons were taken from her. Then, a few weeks later, she saw a chance to escape. Knowing she would be caught if she carried a child, Ingalls left her daughter behind and ran. She fled east, struggling through the New River Gorge up into the mountains. She slept in caves, ate roots and berries, and crossed 500 miles of wilderness. Forty days later, Mary Ingalls saw a cabin near a field of corn and shouted for help. In retaliation for Indian raids, Dinwiddie ordered a surprise attack on the Shawnees in the winter of 1756 and put Andrew Lewis in command. A veteran surveyor who had served with Washington, Lewis was strict, dependable, and unemotional. He is reserved and distant, wrote a relative, his presence more awful than engaging. At Fort Frederick on the New River, Lewis assembled 200 militiamen, including Mary Ingalls' husband, William, and 80 Cherokees, traditional enemies of the Shawnees. Captain William Preston's company was typical. Few were native to Virginia. The average age was 24. Only one was six feet in height, none taller. Most had no military experience. Lewis planned to march from Fort Frederick to the Big Sandy River, follow it to the Ohio, then assault Shawnee villages. On February 18, 1756, the expedition set out. Hoping to move quickly and hunt for game along the way, Lewis carried only a 15-day supply of food. Preston's company didn't even bring tents. Almost immediately, heavy rains and the rugged terrain slowed the march. Then, the rain turned to snow as food supplies dwindled. Wednesday, March 3rd. We marched until sunset and advanced only nine or ten miles, being much retarded by the river and mountains which closed in on both sides. Each man had but half a pound of flour and no meat but what we could kill, and that was very scarce. Captain William Preston. Starving pack horses began to die. Friday the 5th. We marched about nine o'clock this morning and with great difficulty proceeded 15 miles on our journey. The river being very deep almost killed the men 
and more so as they were in utmost extremity for want of provisions. This day, my fourth horse expired, and I was left on foot with a hungry belly, which increased my woe. Preston suggested eating the pack horses. His men refused and threatened to desert if food wasn't found soon. Cherokee scouts reported signs of buffalo and turkey ahead, and Lewis ordered the march to continue. Major Lewis would direct as he thought proper, for common soldiers were by him scarcely treated with humanity. We were now in a pitiable condition, our men looking on one another with tears in their eyes and lamenting that they had ever entered into a soldier's life. Thomas Morton. The Major stepped off some yards distance and desired all that was willing to serve their country and share his fate to go with him. Not above 20 or 30 joined him. It is impossible to express the abject condition we were in, both before and after the men deserted us. William Preston. As order disintegrated, Lewis abandoned the expedition. Starving soldiers straggled back to Fort Frederick. William Ingalls returned to Draper's Meadows, where he and Mary had four more children. Thirteen years later, the Ingalls purchased their eldest son, Thomas, from his adopted Shawnee parents. The boy often disappeared for weeks into the wilderness, carrying only his bow and arrow. The Ingalls never saw their other two children again. In 1758, England launched a major campaign against French strongholds in North America. When 6,000 British troops advanced on Fort Duquesne, French soldiers blew up the fort and withdrew. The British built Fort Pitt in its place. British forces captured Montreal forcing Canada to surrender and France to withdraw from North America. The Treaty of Paris transferred all French territory east of the Mississippi to England. Then, in 1768, England and the Iroquois Confederacy signed the Treaty of Fort Stanwix for $10,000 the Iroquois dropped their claim to land east of the Ohio River. The English wanted to believe that the Indians owned land. They needed to have an owner of the land so that they could purchase this land from its rightful owner. The Iroquois never conquered the Shawnee, but they made everybody think they had. When they went to treaties with the whites, the whites said, uh, well, we want to buy some of your land. And they said, sure, we'll sell you whatever you want. It wasn't their land anyway. This is what caused all the great problems which came later because then having made this purchase, the whites claimed it and said, hey, we bought it fair and square and it's ours. So this is where the wars began. The white man seeks to conquer nature, to bend it to his will and use it wastefully until it is all gone. And then he simply moves on. The whole white race is a monster who is always hungry and what he eats is land. Chicksecca.
Virginia rewarded veterans of the French and Indian War with Western land. 5,000 acres for officers, 50 acres for privates. George Washington, one of the few to recognize the land's value, bought the rights to 30,000 acres from his fellow officers. Any person who neglects the present opportunity of hunting out good lands and marking them for his own in order to keep others from settling them will never regain it. In the fall of 1770, he set out to claim good farmland along the Ohio. To his surprise, Washington found some of the best land already taken. People who were skimping out on a, a little plot of land in the east suddenly saw these great vistas of land open to them if they would just go there and claim it. And so they came in droves. They spilled over the mountains and rushed into these lands and began claiming them as their own. And it was no difficulty. You just simply marked some trees at the four corners of your land and that was then your land. They were leaving a civilized culture and moving into a wilderness, a hidden land, a land that was really fraught with all kinds of dangers and unexpected happenings. They came in and they built rude cabins uh, with very rude tools. Sometimes the cabins were only 10 feet square or 15 or 20 feet square, just enough to house people and keep them relatively safe and relatively warm. They existed with the very barest of necessities, and it was a very hard and rough and difficult life for them. The country here is swarming with wolves and wildcats, and those people called squatters, who neither pay rent nor own their own land, but keep roving the frontiers, advancing the tide of a civilized population. Alexander Wilson. Removing these people will be a work of great difficulty, perhaps of equal cruelty, as most of these people are poor with large families and have sought out these retreats on which perhaps their future prospects wholly depend. George Washington. As white settlers pushed westward, a religious movement swept through Indian villages in the Ohio Valley. Indian prophets urged their people to resume a traditional way of life, to observe sacred rituals, and regain the power to take back their land. Militant Shawnees recruited Cherokees, Mingos, and Delawares to join them in a united Indian front and began attacking white surveyors on the Ohio. Bands of whites crossed the river and raided Indian villages. The Virginians in this part of the country seemed determined to make war with the Indians at any rate. The one half of this country is ruined to all intents and purposes which only a few months ago was in a flourishing way. Devereux Smith. On the night of April 30th, 1774, a group of settlers led by Daniel Greathouse lured eight Indians to the east back of the After drinking together for several hours, the whites suddenly attacked their guests. The Great House Party fell on them and terribly massacred them, shot all the men, bludgeoned and stabbed and otherwise desecrated the women, disemboweled them, hung them from trees. Uh, one was a pregnant woman. They cut her uh, unborn baby out and uh, uh, even scalp this little baby. So it was just a terrible thing. The, we hear so much about the atrocities of the Indians, but the atrocities that some of the whites did were just almost beyond belief. Order. Order. 
The murders shocked colonial leaders. In the Virginia House of Burgesses, Delegate Thomas Jefferson called the act inhuman and indecent. The royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, said the event was marked with an extraordinary degree of cruelty. But he did nothing to bring the murderers to justice. Among the victims were the brother and sister of a Mingo leader named Logan. A baptized Christian, Logan was a friend of many whites and an outspoken advocate of peace. One fur trader called Logan the best specimen of humanity I ever met. I appeal to any white man to say if ever he entered Logan's cabin hungry and he gave him not meat, if ever he came cold and naked and he clothed him not. In cold blood and unprovoked, men murdered all the relations of Logan, not even sparing my women and children. Who is there to mourn for Logan? Not one. Logan's grief turned to rage. He led attacks against Western settlements, personally killing 13 whites before returning to his village. I have fully glutted my vengeance, Logan declared. But fighting continued. The country at this time is in great confusion. There have been broken up and gone off at least 500 families within one week. And I believe it has been the white people's fault altogether. Gilbert Simpson. Lord Dunmore called out the Virginia militia. A cultured Scottish gentleman, known for hosting lavish balls, Dunmore was also a veteran officer who insisted on walking into battle carrying his own equipment. He ordered Major Andrew Lewis to prepare for a combined assault on the Shawnee villages. The unhappy situation of the people settled over the Allegheny Mountains makes it necessary to give the enemies a blow that will break the Indian Confederacy. Lord Dunmore. Lewis was to take troops from Camp Union in the Greenbrier Valley west to the Ohio River. Dunmore would lead a force down the Ohio from Fort Pitt and join him. In early September, Lewis and 1,100 Western militiamen set out. This time, Lewis was prepared. He carried 54,000 pounds of flour on 700 pack horses and drove 100 head of cattle. As Lewis advanced, Dunmore and a thousand troops reached Fort Pitt, where he delayed heading south. Instead, the governor went duck hunting with hounds brought along from Williamsburg. An incredulous frontiersman called Dunmore the most unfit, the most trifling person living. Meanwhile, Shawnee spies learned of the governor's battle plan. The principal Shawnee chief, Cornstalk, decided to attack Lewis before he united with Dunmore. Lewis reached the Ohio in early October and encamped on a narrow tip of land called Point Pleasant. We looked on ourselves in a safe possession of a fine encampment and thought ourselves a terror to all the Indian tribes on the Ohio. Captain William Ingalls. On the night of October 9th, 1,000 Indian warriors and three whites who had been raised with Shawnees 
across the Ohio a few miles above Point Pleasant. In the darkness, they formed a circle around Lewis's camp. Just before dawn, woods began filling up with a fog rising from the Ohio River. Andrew Lewis was preparing to cross the Ohio River that day, and he had given orders that no one was to leave camp. But two men went out to hunt turkey early in the morning, and they got about a mile away from the main campground, and the fog parted momentarily. And suddenly here they saw before them not turkeys, but a vast line of Indians. One of the men was shot. The survivor ran back and alerted the camp, and the battle began. This was a very terrible battle, very closely fought because of the fog. So it became a hand-to-hand -hand battle from the dawning of day until mid-afternoon. The enemy disputed the ground with the greatest obstinacy, often running up to the very muzzles of our guns, where they as often fell victim to their rage. Their bravery exceeded every man's expectations. Their chiefs ran continually along the line, exhorting the men to lie close and shoot well, fight and be strong. William Christian. Indian war cries mixed with the groans of the wounded. The sound was enough to shudder the stoutest heart, said one officer. Despite heavy casualties, Lewis's men held their ground. That evening, Cornstalk withdrew. Cornstalk was a very proud man, and he was not going to have it ever be said that he had turned his back on an enemy. And so as he vacated the battlefield, he walked backward all the way, the smile to where his canoe was wedged, got in the canoe and then stood in it, facing backward while it was paddled across the river. Eager to destroy the Shawnee villages, Lewis took 100 men north to join Dunmore, leaving Colonel William Fleming in charge at Point Pleasant. My dear Nancy, I take this opportunity to write you that you may be convinced I am yet amongst the living. I received three balls, two through my left arm and one in my left breast. If it please God to spare me, I propose coming home the first opportunity. William Fleming. The Shawnees returned to their villages, where militant warriors called for another attack. Cornstalk gave them a choice. Kill all their women and children and fight to the last man or negotiate peace. chose to lay down their arms. I saw four Indian chiefs of the Shawnee Nation who have been at war with the Virginians this summer. It is said they are cruel and barbarous, and I believe they exercise some cruelties. But they are beings endowed with reason and common sense, and are as valuable in the eyes of their maker as we are, and above our level in many virtues. Nicholas Cresswell. Fifteen miles outside the Shawnee villages, Cornstalk met Dunmore to sign a peace treaty. When he arose, he was in no way confused or daunted, but spoke in a distinct and audible voice. His looks while addressing Lord Dunmore were truly grand and majestic. I have heard the first orators of Virginia but never 
have I heard one whose powers of delivery surpassed those of Cornstalk, Benjamin Wilson. Lewis arrived to find the treaty already signed. Furious that Dunmore had excluded him, Lewis threatened to attack Indian villages the next day. Dunmore sent him back to Point Pleasant with orders to build a fort. Upon his return to the capital, Williamsburg, Dunmore took credit for pacifying the frontier and was given a hero's welcome. Colonel William Fleming returned home to his wife, Nancy where after recovering from his wounds, he set up practice as a surgeon. In the spring of 1775, fighting broke out near Boston between British and American troops and quickly erupted into war. Washington, commander of the new Continental Army, requested volunteers from the Virginia frontier. Within a week, two companies left for the battlefront. Unhappy it is that a brother's sword has been sheathed in a brother's breast. But can a virtuous man hesitate in his choice? Loyal to the crown, Lord Dunmore seized Virginia's supply of gunpowder and had it put aboard a British ship. When colonial troops captured Williamsburg, Dunmore fled back to England. The Americans were led by General Andrew Lewis. The Revolutionary War forced native people once more to choose sides between warring groups of whites. Many thought an alliance with the British would buy them at least temporary safety. In 1777, known as the Bloody Year of the Three Sevens, Shawnee war parties again struck the western Virginia frontier, now nearly emptied of young men. The express came softly to the door, and by a gentle tapping, waked the whole family. My father seized his gun. A stepmother dressed the children to be taken to the fort. The greatest care was taken not to waken the youngest child. To the rest, it was enough to say, Indian. Not a whimper was heard afterwards. Joseph Doddridge. At the fort Lewis had built near Point Pleasant, Cornstalk warned Commander Matthew Arbuckle that he was no longer able to restrain his young warriors. All Shawnees are our enemies, declared Arbuckle. He took Cornstalk and his son prisoner. A week later, two whites were killed near the fort. An angry mob went to Cornstalk's cell. Cornstalk arose and met them. Seven or eight bullets were fired into him. I grieved to see him so long a dying. The great Cornstalk, who was undoubtedly a hero. John Stewart. Five settlers were charged with murder, but they were all acquitted when no witnesses would testify against them. The Indians, the ones who were old and wise and knew the way things were going, said that there was no way to defeat the whites because the whites were like the leaves on the trees, numberless. They were like the grass beneath their feet that even when cut down would spring back up 
with more and more than there were before. They were like the worm, which, when cut in half, would make not one dead worm, but two new worms. When an Indian died, it was a great tragedy, a great loss to the people that caused a sorrow in their heart. An Indian was irreplaceable to them. After five years of warfare, 200 Indians and British soldiers surrounded Fort Henry on Wheeling Creek in September 1782. Leading the attack was Joseph Brandt, an educated Mohawk chief who was also an officer in the British Army. When ammunition in the fort ran low, 16-year-old Betty Zane volunteered to get gunpowder stored in a nearby house. She said, your lives are more important than mine, and maybe they won't shoot because I'm a woman. So she gathered up her skirts and took a running start and hit the ground going as fast as she could, and the Indians yelled out, a squaw, a squaw, and didn't shoot. They poured a keg of gunpowder into her apron, and then she ran back. And by this time, the Indians were waiting, and they started firing at her. And spurts of ground flew up all around her as she ran. But she managed to get back with the gunpowder and save the day. Grant withdrew the next day. Raids continued, but Fort Henry was the last large-scale Indian battle in Western Virginia. The following year, England and the United States signed the Peace of Paris, ending the war. England gave up its land south of Canada and east of the Mississippi. The treaty didn't mention any land for Indians. With peace, settlers poured across the mountains. My dear sister, this country has suffered much by the Indians this summer. If we had trade and peace with the Indians, we might live very well. But at present, my advice is never to think of coming through the wilderness to this country. I remain your ever affectionate and Christian. In 1794, President Washington sent 3,000 troops under Anthony Wayne to secure the western frontier. At the Battle of Fallen Timbers near Lake Erie, Wayne defeated a force of 2,000 Indians then burned their villages to the ground. The defeat crushed Indian hopes of keeping their lands in the Ohio Valley. Embittered and demoralized, the Shawnees moved west. It was fate. The time had come for the Indian epic to end east of the Mississippi. In 1805, a Gilmer County man saw an Indian behind a tree near his house. He shot and killed him without asking questions. These counties, remote from commerce and civilized life, confined to their everlasting hills of freezing cold, present a distinct republic of their own, every way different from any people. Anne Royal.
most of the people who settled the mountains came out of choice, not out of chance. They were looking for a terrain that was similar to the areas that they had known in the old country, to land that was rich and valleys that were rich. It was a group of people who came seeking independence and a sense of community and uh, a lifestyle and a way of looking at life that uh, really set them apart, I think, from what one might have found in the New England colonies or in the Deep South or on the far western frontier. Oh, how many thousands of poor souls have we to seek out in the wilds of America? who are but one remove from the Indians and the comforts of civilized society, and considering that they have the Bible in their hands, worse in their morals than the savages. Francis Asbury. He was an itinerant minister who rode thousands of miles every year through a frontier nearly empty of churches. Francis Asbury, America's first Methodist bishop, preached in open fields and hog barns six days a week, three times on Sundays. Everywhere, he delivered a simple and appealing message. All believers were saved, not just a chosen few. At Cheat River, we had a mixed congregation of sinners, Presbyterians, Baptists, and it may be of saints. Asbury performed baptisms, marriages, funerals, and trained other backwoods ministers to spread the word. Known as circuit riders, they were so zealous that a common saying in bad weather went, there is no one out today but crows and Methodist preachers. My mind has been severely tried under the great fatigue endured by myself and my horse. This country will require much to make it tolerable. The people are the boldest cast of adventurers. Francis Asbury. In the mountains, circuit riders found a people often more concerned with survival than salvation. Eastern clergymen claimed that mountain people were godless, yet many welcomed a faith that accepted them as they were. Frequently, aspects of frontier life involved drinking and activities that would be deemed to be unacceptable back east. That doesn't mean that mountain people were not religious. Uh, that sense of, of distinction between uh, a personal religion, which is the kind of religion I think that one finds in the mountains, uh, and uh, abiding by the tenets and rules of some larger national denomination or larger national expectations, has been one of those things that has set the mountains off from other areas of the country and I think is directly associated with the strong sense of independence that one finds in the region. Methodist prayer services grew into camp meetings lasting several days. Thousands came to pray and sing from dawn till midnight. They pitched tents and filled tables with hams, biscuits, and apple pies. Organizers posted guards in a losing effort to keep out whiskey. A well-regulated camp meeting is one of the best institutions in the world to quicken and stir up believers and to get souls converted to God. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! I could live and die at such a place in such exercise. Daniel Hitt.
By 1810, the population of Western Virginia approached 100,000. Increasingly, Methodist churches dotted a landscape of towns and villages. Yet much of the land remained wild and remote, its people fiercely independent. In 1818, the National Road, America's first federal highway, was completed from Cumberland, Maryland to Wheeling, Virginia. Mail coaches, Conestoga wagons, and herds of cattle filled the road, which connected the eastern seaboard with the Ohio River, the gateway to the west. Steamboats, a recent invention, carried freight and passengers from Wheeling to New Orleans. In Wheeling, a village of less than a thousand, the National Road's impact was enormous. Iron foundries, cotton mills, distilleries, glass and tobacco factories opened along the waterfront. The road brought thousands of European immigrants who found work as laborers. By 1825, Wheeling had grown into an industrial center with the second largest population in Virginia. Only Richmond, the capital, was bigger. Despite its growth, Western Virginia had little political power within the state. Eastern counties held more seats in the legislature, and Virginia law limited voting rights to landowners, which favored wealthy Eastern planters and excluded many Western laborers. Western delegate John George Jackson called the situation a burlesque upon representative government. In response to complaints from Western leaders, Virginia called a convention in 1829 to review its constitution. Representing Brook County in northwestern Virginia was Alexander Campbell, an energetic Irish preacher who had formed his own dissident church, the Disciples of Christ. Campbell argued against basing suffrage on wealth. Why not use strength, intellect, or artistic talent as a standard, he asked. It is not the increase of population in the West which you ought to fear. It is the energy which the mountain breeze and Western habits impart to these immigrants. The Old Dominion has long been celebrated for producing men that can split hairs in all questions of political economy. But when they return from Congress, they have Negroes to fan them asleep. A Western Virginia statesman, though far inferior in rhetoric, has this advantage, that when he returns home, he takes off his coat and takes hold of the plow. This preserves his Republican principles, pure and uncontaminated. Alexander Campbell. Campbell proposed giving the vote to all white males. But Eastern delegates rejected the idea. What real share does any man suppose the peasantry of the West can or will take in affairs of state Benjamin Lee. Western leaders returned home empty-handed. The Wheeling Gazette called for dividing Virginia. Peaceably if we can, it wrote. Forcibly if we must.
In the summer of 1831, Nat Turner, an educated slave who had visions of black and white spirits engaged in battle, led slaves on a rampage through Southampton County, Virginia. Fifty-five whites were killed. Turner and 16 other slaves were captured and hanged at Jerusalem, the county seat. Turner's rebellion spread panic throughout the South. Virginia increased its militia, restricted the movement of slaves, and prohibited their education. But some Virginians began to question slavery itself. Before I leave this government, I will have contrived to have a law passed gradually abolishing slavery in this state or to begin the work by prohibiting slavery on the west side of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Governor John Floyd. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I see, glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, Slavery existed in most western counties but on a smaller scale than that found on eastern Virginia plantations. Farmers usually owned only a few slaves and often worked beside them in the fields. Yet conditions for slaves in western Virginia could be as bad as anywhere. Slave families were routinely separated. A slaveholder in Shepherdstown offered to sell a female slave with or without her four children. In Harper's Ferry, a woman gave her granddaughter a slave as a birthday present. In the hot salt works along the Kanar River, slaves were leased, not bought, because the dangerous work wore them out so quickly. Runaway slaves were lashed publicly over several days. Each new whipping called tickling up the old scabs. Those who weren't caught headed for the Ohio River. The Ohio River was the gateway to freedom. If you could get to the Ohio River and get across, you were in free territory. All along on the Ohio side of the river, colonies began to develop with free black people in them. There was land ownership, um, they were raising crops, they were involved in uh, shipping and steamboating and uh, barrel making, and they were beginning to be educated. There were small schools that were developing just across the river. So those communities which were developing presented uh, a view of what life as free people could be for those slaves who were still on the Virginia side. In Parkersburg on the Ohio, Robert Simmons, the son of a slave and her white master, opened a barber shop, wrote newspaper articles under an assumed name, and organized the first free school for blacks in the South. Many Western Virginians who didn't own slaves resented those who did. If you desire to employ slave labor, 
a farmer told a new resident. I would advise you to go to hell, as slavery is said to flourish best in warm climates. Here, you will find yourself among a people who can take care of themselves. Yet few Westerners objected to slavery on moral grounds. We desire to be impartial on this subject, being neither in love with slavery nor abolitionism. As a philosopher and a Christian, I would say to the North, let the South have their slaves and throw no impediment in the way. Alexander Campbell. Campbell suggested sending all blacks, slave and free, back to Africa. In 20 years, he said, slavery in America would disappear. When we arrived at the springs, all the walks leading from the different cabins were streaming in lively forms. A band was playing gaily in the dining hall, and the whole face of things had the look of enchantment, as if the inhabitants of some fairy isle were turning out to welcome the coming of expected strangers. At first, they came for the water. Believers claimed it relieved headaches, arthritis, even mental disorders. It cures ugliness itself, said one, causes sailors to forget and lawyers to confess the truth. Spurred by epidemics of cholera and yellow fever in the lowlands, the elite of Eastern Virginia escaped in summertime to Western Virginia's mountain spas. All of the first Old Virginia and Carolina families were at the springs when I arrived. I was never at any watering place in England where their company was so good and so select. Frederick Marriott. The most famous resort was White Sulphur Springs in the Greenbrier Valley. Elegant cottages fanned out in rows, including Paradise Row for newlyweds and Wolf Row for bachelors. White sulfur has something eminently aristocratic about it. You feel that you are with your fellows here. John H. B. Latrobe. Opposite the cottages sat the massive Grand Central Hotel. 400 feet long, known to patrons as simply the White. If I can't go to the White as I am accustomed to, declared a Richmond judge, I'll just stay home and die. It was the closest thing the Old South had to a summer capital. The power in the Congress was in southern hands, in southern congressmen. And the president were coming to talk to the congressmen and meet them on their own turf. So uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, Tyler, Van Buren, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, these are all pre-war presidents who came here. And you could meet who you needed to meet. It's sort of a concentration of uh, power and money, but in a resort atmosphere. The hotel dining room seated 1,200 guests. Many brought their own slaves to serve them. Others relied on slaves owned by the hotel. If you have no servant, you must bribe one of those attached to the place or you run the risk of getting little or nothing. Bribe high and you live high. Avoid bribery and you starve. John H.B. Latrobe. 
By the late 1850s, White Sulphur Springs had replaced nearly a hundred of its slaves with free blacks. The change went largely unnoticed by the resort's slave-holding patrons, but its larger meaning would soon become painfully clear. On the morning of June 1, 1858, 50 prominent American artists boarded a train at the Camden Street Depot in Baltimore. 